God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Please rise as we sing of the greatness of the Lord.
Father, thank you for Jesus, your perfect gift of grace. Your word and your truth set us free. Your love and grace claims our brokenness and makes it whole. Your strength is our stronghold and picks us up when fear threatens to overcome us. Your power turns our self-pity into confidence. Help us, by your grace, to shed the sin we, cho we still choose to carry. Forgive what our lips tremble to name. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us your future in which we are made new. We ask this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, God has atoned for sins we could not ever cover. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. We are a new creation. Together and by God's grace, may we walk in the newness of life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. May the Lord of the peace be with you always. And also with you. Please turn to your neighbor and share a sign of your Lord, the Lord's peace with one another. Let us enjoy this time of welcome. Please be seated. This is a special time for the giving jar. Today's giving jar is designated to Kirk and Sandy Brown, chaplains to foster care. Let us welcome this special time of giving.
Our first reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 3. Our reading begins after Adam and Eve have sinned by eating from the forbidden tree. Their sin brings harm to the whole world. Because of their sin, they will live in a sinful world, a world, a world of chaos. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. I will crawl, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life and I put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. The end of the first reading. Psalm 5 is our responsive reading for today. Please respond with the dark, bold-faced print. O Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Therefore, the, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with, the, with deepest awe. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. Second reading comes from Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. God's love 
sinners so much that Christ died for us, not because we were good, but because his love is that great. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinner, Christ died for us. If you are able to, please stand for the gospel reading to honor the gospels, which is from the first chapter of the gospel according to John. Okay, there we go. So I gotta get this thing turned on anyway. Oh well. John chapter 8 and John chapter 1. You got Matthew. Okay. Well, I have John up here. I'll let David figure that out. And somehow there's supposed to be. No, it still says Matthew. Okay. Well, don't pay any attention to that. Well, pay attention. It's probably good things because it's from the gospel, but it's not what we're talking about. We read from the first chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning with the first verse. John writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that had been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Gospel of the Lord. And please be seated. I invite the the children to come and join us. Would young folks want to come on up here? I've I've redone the treats thing, so we got some really good stuff in there. If you don't take it, I will. (laughs) No, I want to be careful with that. Let me get down here in front of you a little bit so I can kind of look at you as we talk. Well, good morning, everybody. You all know what this is, right? What do we call it? Now, I've got a really kind of crazy question for you. Do you know that if you lived in England or Australia, or New Zealand, places where we've lived. You know what we'd call it there? Any idea? A torch. What does it do? What does a flashlight or a torch do? It makes so you can. It makes light so you can see. Exactly. Exactly. You use this. Mm-hmm. When you're outside at night, maybe, to help you see in the darkness? Or if you go in a dark room, if you got one of these, it helps, right? Because the light shows you where things are, doesn't it? With light, you can know how to get someplace, how to walk, right? That's why a flashlight is good. We learned in our lesson today, the one I just read, John says that Jesus came as light. In fact, if you read in the book of Genesis, the first word that God speaks when the universe was created is the word light. It's 
the very first thing that happens when God created everything. He says, light. And light overcomes darkness, doesn't it? Because where there is light, there can't be darkness, can there? And the only way there can be darkness is if you turn off the light, right? Light is stronger than darkness, isn't it? And that's what we talk about Jesus bringing light. Because when we follow God through Christ, it's like having a light in a dark room. We can see, we can understand, and we can go his way. And that's what's so wonderful about, you know, coming to church, going to Sunday school. It's like having a flashlight in a dark room. Without the flashlight, you're in trouble, aren't you? With the flashlight, you've got a chance to get around it. So think of that. So we think of Jesus as light. And darkness can't be stronger than light ever. Let's pray. Lord, help us to trust you as the one who guides us. To be our light in all the darkness that we see in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Now I got some good treats up here. And I don't have to say this because I picked them out. So come and get some treats. See, look how they get here. And if you dig in here. How many can we pick? Hey, pick a, keep, pick a couple. Ooh, look at that. Big hands. Well, we're about to start our new series. And in this series, we talk about chaos. So I want you to think a bit about the world we live in. Not hard to do. Would you say that the world we live in is nice and orderly and everything is in its place? Or is it messed up? I don't think I have to be a mind reader to know the answer to that, do I? We all look around and see there's a lot of things messed up in the world we live in today. Among things, you know, I I hear stuff in in the culture and the media uh, promoting something as being moral and good that everything I had been taught was that was those things were just the opposite of moral and good. It was immoral and bad and dangerous. We see conflicts, you know, constantly in in the world. Uh, I mean, there's a level of anger that I hear in our political stuff that I don't really remember hearing uh, too much before in my lifetime. It's there in our history, but not directly in my experience. I um, I mean, goodness, we, I mean, there's even confusion in weather, isn't there? And this has been kind of an odd year in terms of, of drought and the lack of rainfall, like last year was wonderful. Uh, but, you know, there's big, big weather events that have been very inconvenient for people, but tough, tough times. Um, it's chaos that we live in. And so we're going to talk in this series about how do we as believers love in the midst of a world of chaos. And our, our series is going to be with a man named Bob Goff, inspired by him, who's going to give us some insights into how do we love in a world of chaos. And and this, you know, I think fits well with what we've been doing as a congregation for the past year or more. A little over a year ago, we started again going through the series, the story. And of course, we see the illustrations of that uh, in our sanctuary right now. But the whole purpose of that was to know the story of the Bible. What is it the Bible tries to communicate to us? So that it increased our, primarily our head knowledge. Knowledge that went throughout us, but appeals to each individual. 
this summer, we took a look at, at what is Paul and Peter and John and some of the other apostles tell us through the Holy Spirit as to how we are to care for one another as people living within a congregation of Christ, a community of faith. And we called that the summer of joy, but we were applying this within our own congregation. Now we're looking at a third step in this, um, which we call love and chaos. And this is how do we apply this to the world? It was how do we take what we've learned that we apply within our community, strengthen in our community, and apply this to the world in which we live? Well, let's take a look at the at the trailer to this Love and Chaos series. Do you express love because you've got an agenda for other people? Because when love has an agenda, it isn't love anymore, it's a program. We're gonna talk about culture and how there's this conflict that's happening. It's not just a chaotic world that we live in, but you gotta understand what's going on inside you to understand the chaos that's going on around you. And what I hope you'll do is just say, what can I do strategically with my faith to launch it into the world, be the aroma of Christ? I'm not thinking Bible study, I'm thinking Bible doing. And I'm kind of old fashioned. I don't think we lead people to Jesus. I think Jesus leads people to Jesus. Jesus doesn't need PR people. He wants people who are obedient to the things that he said. And what he's asking you to do is love people in a context of conflict. And here's the way we do it, with kindness and respect. Do that and you are gonna demonstrate to this world that your faith is authentic and this aroma of Christ will fill the room. Well, we don't have to look at headlines to find things that affect our life that are chaotic or messed up. Most of us look into just the immediate circumstances of our life and we can find things aplenty that fit that definition. In many of our families, I know there's, there will be some ongoing tension maybe caused by, by siblings who for some reason just refuse to really get along or between too common in our culture between ex-spouses ex or even current spouses. We, we know that just living in neighborhoods sometimes can be enough of a challenge. And for our young people going to school, just keeping friendships there or making friends or whatever is going on in school can be, well, pretty much a mess sometimes. You know, there's a lot of things that go on eternally that fit the definition of chaos. We don't need other people to cause it. Enough of it is present already. But how do we, within this chaotic community, then express the love of Christ? That's what we're going to be about. And we need a couple of things first. This first I want to share with you, and I think this is important, the, the biblical teaching about where this chaos comes from. How does this come about? What does the scripture teach us? And, and in this part... I think I'm going to be doing more of a Bible study than really a, a sermon. But it's important stuff, I think. But there's an inspiration part of this, too, because when we're done with that, we want to look at what, how God responds to that. And this is how amazing it is that God sends us Christ. And then understand what having Christ in our life does that empowers us to do what it says up here, to love in chaos. Well, let's go to the book of Genesis. I think most of us know that in the first chapter of Genesis is the story of creation. And many would tell that more important than whether or not God used six 24-hour days to create the universe is, is the constant observation in Genesis that when God finished each aspect of creation, he declared that this was good. And when it was all finished, God said it was very good. In other words, God created things that, was, that were wonderful, that was a blessing. they were things that were in harmony, we could say. Everything was working together. And then God created man, male and female. And, and he puts them down in the Garden of Eden. 
And Eden, by the way, in the Hebrew means uh, plenty or luxury. This was a place in which you could, could live in absolute perfection. Everything was there that humans needed to, to live in the best possible life. And there was harmony again, as God had created. Harmony between God and the people. And because there was harmony between God and the people, there was harmony with each other and harmony with all of creation. And there was only one thing that they were supposed to observe. This is in the second chapter of Genesis. And the Lord God commanded the man, says, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You know, sometimes we think we know what's in the scriptures because we hear it so often. You know, one of the things that, that I'm sure that if, well, certainly if I went out in the street and asked, but even maybe among us, if I asked something about when did sin begin, that a very common answer might be, well, it all started when Eve ate the... Yeah. The Bible doesn't say that, by the way. And among these things that we get, it's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. Although when, when we leave today, when everybody take a piece of sour apple candy, <laughs> which is a good way to remind us of this, and, and, and it was like the stuff that I had Wednesday night, it's really sour. <laughs> but notice the name of the tree. Yeah, the olive is good and evil, yeah. It's not like a, any fruit tree that, that we would encounter. There was something different about this tree. And simply the Holy Spirit is, is using a, a, a level of communication here of a truth that, that, that goes deeper into all sorts of things. But anyway, the tree that is there that they're prohibited from eating from is not any kind of a fruit tree that you and I would ever encounter. There's something different about this tree. It's a tree to the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, stay away from that. Because what God is telling him is that you and I have a perfect relationship. You trust me for all your knowledge. You trust my ways and you live in my ways. You don't need to seek out your own knowledge. You have my knowledge. And that's going to put you in harmony with myself and with everything there is. Living by God's way produces harmony, doesn't it? And then the serpent comes along. We know what happens there in Genesis 3. Notice the serpent's temptation does not appeal to anything with their physical appetite. He doesn't tell them this is chocolate and you can't resist it. He says instead, he appeals to pride, doesn't he? He says, eat from this tree and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And of course, what happens when they eat from that tree, however that happens, is what they're really doing is they're telling God, we don't need you anymore. We can figure out good and evil for ourselves. We don't need your way when we can have our way. I don't want to do it your way, God. I want to do it my way. And man, hasn't that produced a wonderful world? But anyway, what happens immediately after this is once they disobey God, once they seek their own knowledge rather than God's knowledge, harmony with God is broken. And when harmony with God is broken, harmony with all of creation must be broken too, even between themselves. We know what happens when God comes into the garden. We just read that. They run and hide. They're ashamed. They don't want to be around God. God scares them. And then, of course, when God asks, what did you do? The man comes up with this statement that I think is one of the greatest ducking of accountability statements you'll find any place in human history. This, this is the first one, and it's probably the, the, the 
in that context, the best of them all. Notice what he says right away. The woman, yeah, the woman, then he, and he gets the other, that you put here with me. In a few more words, he blames the woman and blames God for what he did. And he says, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. In other words, ain't my fault, God. Boy, doesn't that, that, doesn't that say it all? I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's so remarkable. And of course, we see the disharmony. We see that in the rest of what we read in our first lesson, but we saw it more as we went through the story. You know, from this point on, everything is a struggle. Everything is chaos, we could say. Remember the first sins that lead to the flood, and then after the flood, all of the things that happen. And then even after God intervenes and rescues the slave from Egypt, we know in the Exodus, again and again, those people freed by the miraculous acts of God don't trust God again. Try their own way. Then going back, to, then, then the judges, when they get in the, the, the promised land, went through the judges. We did a study of the judges in our small group and we couldn't wait to get done with it because it was so, in some ways, depressing as all the stupid stuff that people did. So much like real life, because it was. Then they get the kings. And the kings don't improve anything. It still is a messed up world they're living in. They reject the prophets who call them back to God. They go to captivity in Babylon. When they come back, they still need prophets. They still don't have it done. The Old Testament is pretty graphic about that. But then, we read in the New Testament, in the very beginning, the amazing story of how God responds to all of this. God's been interactive with them all along, but now in the New Testament, as God begins, God takes the final and his greatest step. And it begins as John here defines the actions of God. John 1, this is the first few verses. But by the way, you may not know this, but John chapter 1 is the traditional reading for Christmas Day. Where I worship on Christmas Day. We don't think of John 1 as being Christmassy, but this is the Christmas Day traditional reading when Christians gather to celebrate. And John begins by saying is, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. What he's saying there is that the, this, this, the Word, who will be Christ, is the power of God. Remember again Genesis chapter two, when God speaks God's first word is light. Beginning of creation, light. God's word is what's there. God's word is the power, the power of God to produce everything that is. And John is telling him this is the power of God, the word that comes to us in Christ. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came for the father, full of grace and truth. In other words, when Christ is born, he is full of God's grace, which means that, that this, in many ways, grace is just the fullness of God's interaction with us. Fullness of God continuing to care for us, even though we have walked away and broken our harmony with him, God still reaches out. Remember, back in the garden, it's God that comes into the garden to find them, not the other way around. And God continues to do this, and now in Christ, it's all done. His fullness is there in his grace and in his truth. And God blinks is the absolute truth. And because all of this takes us to Christ and all that he does to rescue us. And Paul would explain it to people like this. He says, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He includes that thought by saying, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. The amazing thing that we proclaim as believers in Christ 
We don't proclaim that we have walked away from sin. We're still sinners. We still sometimes add to the confusion and the chaos of the world. But yet God says, I call you to rescue you from that through the grace that I give you and my son. And what's more, that calling equips us to be instruments of his grace in the world. To proclaim that love to others. And this is important to understand. We don't love people who deserve to be loved. If we only love people who deserve to be loved, then our love is simply a reaction to them. God's love is not a reaction, it's an action. That means God, the love comes first. Just as God's love to us comes first. So we're called to see, do the same to others. This is what the Love and Chaos series would, would, would illustrate to us so well. And I think if, if you get into small groups, I'm going to promote more in a little bit. But you'll find Bob Goff, the, the teacher, just a delight to listen to. But also very insightful. How do we love? How are we God's people? How do we testify to the world? A chaotic world. But yet we're the God of love. And we can do that can do that. So it invites you now to, you know, to, to, to look forward to the rest of the fall. We have 10 Sundays left. Uh, six of the Sundays, we'll look at these themes. We're going to have some other Sundays interspersed with that. But six of the times, we'll look at these. We probably won't do the videos anymore because they're a little bit longer maybe than to watch. But if you join a small group, you get to begin by watching, watching his videos and their fun. So I'd urge you to to not only make worship a priority in the fall, but you always hear pastors tell you that. I don't think I'd ever tell you as a pastor to stay home from church. Uh, but consider joining the small groups. I know that's kind of an effort, but we've got a sign-up group out there. We have several available. And I'd still urge you, if you can't find one that fits your schedule, go ahead and start one. If you get a chance, go home. And if you've got access to Right Now Media, look it up. Watch some of the series. They're easy to watch. If you don't have access, call the office and we'll tell you how to get in touch with it. But anyway, that's what we're looking at. Love and chaos. It's going to be a good fall. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise if you're able? Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Amazing God, you spoke the word and there was light and all that your word made was good. Even as we chose to follow our own ways instead of your goodness, you continued to care for us. You even joined us in the mess that we made of your creation. With your spirit, help us now to always rejoice in your goodness and to trust your word that brings to us your truth and your grace. Lord, in your mercy. Jesus, we declare that you are the, our Lord and Savior, so guide us to love those who are caught up in the chaos of this world. May we love them as you love us. May they know the joy of living and the amazing grace you bring into this chaos. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Spirit, we turn to you, the power that forms the church. Continue to guide our search for an associate pastor. Help us to trust that you will bring into this community of faith the one who will best strengthen our walk with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we lift to you those in, who are in need of your healing. We lift to you Duane Senegal and Scott McGarry. Bud Johnson and Jean Olkey, Darlene Petska, John Anderson, Rena Burnt, and Chad Tracy. May they have a sure confidence in your loving care. We also join with family and friends as they pray for Bruce and Emery and Carl, Abby and Tim and Linda, Asher and Talon, Peggy and Brett, Alice and Don and Alyssa and those that we name before you in our hearts at this time.
with them, Lord. We lift to you those in military service, Alex Holly, Ryan Baxter, Tim Davies, Brooke Carper, and all those who are following your call to defend our nation. May they know your shepherding hand each and every day. For all these, Lord, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we do lift up to you those who are caught up in all the many difficult weather events. Send your Holy Spirit to heal those who have suffered the loss of loved ones. Send your people to those who have been injured and to those who have lost so much of the importance in their lives. May they sense your healing and compassionate embrace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And may the grace and peace and your grace and peace enable us to, to love amidst the chaos. Grant whatever you see that we need, for we pray in the great name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now together, let us celebrate our Lord's Supper. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, also the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it to remember me. Because you are one with us, O Christ, make us one with you as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite the communion servers to please come forward. The rest of you may be seated for the moment, and please come forward as the ushers direct.
Would you please rise if you're able? Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with His, with his favor and grant you His peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to dismiss, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, as Pastor Bill said, if you really, uh, we really encourage you to dig deep in this because if you, there is that crisis between okay, well, there's all that all this chaos out there. I don't know what to do about it. Join a small group. Join a small group. Then you're going to be able to dive more, much more deeply, be able to talk about it much more richly. And the sign, uh, it, all the information is outside these doors. We have a, a small group that's going to be meeting tomorrow at 9 o'clock on Mondays. Uh, and also at 6 o'clock in the evening at tomorrow Pastor night. Bill and Deb's house. Okay. And then we have another one at Tuesday on six, at 6.30 in the evening. And from there on out, you'll have to look at the list. I can't, I'm not going to draw it all up exactly the way it should be. But anyway, join a small group. Um, and with that, are, are there any other announcements? What was it? Oh, well, yes. Next week, we are going to have a special guest here to usher us into a little further in, into that series. And so, uh, so I'm just going to let you have that be a worthwhile reason to return to worship uh, on Sunday is to figure out who is the special guest that's coming to us. So, well, right? it, it's put this way. Somebody, if you, everything the Holy Spirit makes work, you may see a lot more of her in, in, in the years to come. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Len. Egg cartons. Yes. Were the eggs in them or empty? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd you know, make, make a note of, of next Sunday. I know it's Cranfest and all that, but 
You can't make 10.30, make 8 o'clock. Not doing that. And, and, yeah. no, and you, the, the bookmark in the bulletin, too, fits the theme for the thing is not Bible study, Bible doing is what we're trying yes. to talk about. Yeah. And make sure you get sour apple candy before you go. All right. Any other announcements? Yes. Just remember to greet one another, enjoy one another. May you go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.